uh, throughout the month of, eight, of, of October all the way to November 2nd, probably the 5th. Um, and um, the kickoff is today. So my name is Dr. Maria Elena Cruz and I am here with Maria Luisa Colmaneres. So we're so happy that you are here with us for this platica. But um, here is a picture of the series that we're going to be part of this year. And I'm so glad that we're all virtually together. Um, usually this doesn't happen. You know, we usually have different altares in different places at, at SJSU. So I'm really happy and proud that we've collaborated with everybody here on this flyer. Uh, the first part, the historical context and lecture and the creation of ofrendas, that's us. We will be presenting that today. The second part will be my, my culture is not co a costume and um, a look at uh, cultural appropriation with mosaic and nasal with Native American studies. And, um, and then, so that's gonna be TBA. It'll be coming, uh, the, the actual date will be coming out soon. And then part three, La Cultura Cura, a community health and healing practices sponsored by the Chicanx Latinx Student Su Success Center. They're also gonna have their uh, date coming out pretty soon. And the last part of the virtual of the series is going to be a virtual altar um, uh, spearheaded by Michael Aguilar at the SJSU library. So we're so happy um, that we were able to collaborate with everybody here. And I thank everybody for being a part of this. It's, it's, it's amazing. I'm really happy that we're doing this at San Jose State. Today we'll be talking about the history and creation of the altar for Dia de los Muertos. And again, I'm Maria Elena Cruz and I am here with Maria Luisa Colmaneres. So thank you for being with us. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about before, before I started sort of the historical context of uh, Dia de los Muertos um, is sort of this year, right? This year has been really trying and uh, we've all been through a lot. So I wanted to honor and remember some people and some uh, things that have happened during 20, the 2020 uh, year, right? And so I wanted to honor like Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, and countless other um, black people who have been killed by racial injustices uh, on, at the hands of the police, right? And I also wanted to honor a lot of the people or many people that have tried crossing these borders, right? These, these man-made borders that have, been, that have been made where people have passed on trying to cross to get here to make a better life. Um, I wanted to honor and remember them. I also wanna honor the children, right? We have children that are in cages and that are in detention centers right now and that are separated from their families um, and who have also died, right? They're right now dying of this so-called flu. They're calling it the flu, but it, we all know it's COVID and they're in these horrific spaces. So I'm praying for them and praying for those people that have passed on in those spaces. Also, um, all of us have, uh, maybe lost someone through, through COVID or because of COVID or know somebody that we've lost because of COVID and the pandemic. And so we're honoring those people and the people that have COVID. I know I came very close to losing my, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law and my sister-in-law, all three of them had COVID, but my father-in-law had the, the, the worst of it, right? And he was in the hospital for a long time. So we almost lost him and I'm just grateful and thankful that we didn't lose him to COVID. So I am praying for all those people and I'm honoring all those people that have passed on because of this horrible pandemic. Um, we're also, I think, um, mourning a lot of the things that we used to do and how we used to do them. Um, we used to be able to go to work, some of us, right, that have a job and some of us lost jobs. And some of us lost just the way we used to do things. And I think a lot of us um, should honor and, and, and remember that as well. Um, I know things change, not, not all things stay the same. So I wanted to honor that for everybody here that is mourning just the way you used to do things, right? And the way the things that used to be. I always say that his, her, his history, her history. Um, I say that because a lot of the mujeres do a lot of the work, right? We do a lot of the um, labor intensive work in regards to organizing and we come together and I've seen it in my circles and I've seen it in circles today where a lot of mujeres are always um, part of this history. And I think sometimes we get we get erased or it's not thought about. So I always put her history, his history for Dia de los Muertos. This tradition is over 3000 years old. Um, it's probably older, but most people don't know that it started more than 3000 years ago. Um, and it started by indigenous peoples, right? Uh, such as the Nahua, Aztec, Chichimeca, Purepacha, Mayan, 
uh, so many more who celebrated the lives of their beloveds who passed. And um, yeah, I did. It, I just want to make sure that people know that it didn't start, you know, with Coco the movie, right? We love, I love Coco the movie. I'm not trying to say anything bad about it, but, but it didn't start there and it didn't start now, certainly. So I wanted to make that point. I also wanted to say that um, this celebration of life um, after 500 years of colonization and tradition, we're still celebrating it. So that gives me great joy um, because here we are, right? Here we are, and we are talking about Dia de los Muertos still. And we are, even though times have changed, things change, tradition uh, changes, right? Things are never static. I'm happy that we're here together still talking about celebrating um, those people that we love, right? And those people that we're honoring, uh, especially here in, in 2020. So um, in the history of, of more than 3,000 years, um, there have been relics and there have been statues uh, 3,000 years ago, right? And Mikalwitontli, uh, which is, means Feast of the Ancestors or Feast of the Dead. Mikwe means dead. Witontli means festival, so celebration of the dead, right? And this celebration used to take place in approximately probably about three month period or per three months period of time. Um, it was um, done in July to August. So what's interesting about that to me when I was reading the history and the sort of looking at the research of this is that during those months, there's also um, the corn, right? The, the planting of corn. And still to this day in Mexico and South America and Central America is when it really rains. That's the rainy season uh, for most of Mesoamerica, right? Uh, from July through August, we plant the corn, people plant the corn in July, and then the cosechas in August, right? We, we pick it up and pick it and eat it in, in the, on the 12th, usually around August, late August or middle of August. And that still happens today, right? So the correlation I think about is like, wow, they used to celebrate and give corn and, and use corn as an ofrenda, right? And we still do that to this day. So for me, it's really, um, really beautiful to think about that and that they used to celebrate for three months and then it was also in the cycle of the corn and that is in the Aztec calendar but I didn't put the Aztec calendar here because it's really I think intricate and complicated and I, I don't think I can cover it all or cover some of the pieces but um, I think in the future I'll try to but it's, it's really interesting so how do we know right how do we know that they celebrated you know the dead or day of the dead um, during these times and uh, and with these relics, right? Well, we're, we have indigenous pre-Hispanic relics such as this that you see in the picture, right? In the pictures that I, I have here posted, Mika uh, Wintontli right here, I think you can see my cursor. Um, that one I took a picture of in Veracruz. Um, and so, and so you know, that and this one on the bottom right underneath it, I took that picture in Mexico de Efe. And so, Day of the Dead, of course, was celebrated in various different ways in different regions, but all celebrated, you know, Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. And how do we know that? We know that because we have oral traditions from our ancestors. We have oral traditions that have been passed down from generation. We have the Aztec calendar, which tells its own story, right, about death, rebirth, and death um, in that calendar. And we have these, like these statues and these that are really important to think about in regards to life and death, right? That you, can, you know that mostly the Aztec, and I'm talking about really the Aztec the people in that region of Mexico who celebrated uh, the dead. There's relics all over the place and probably some that haven't even been um, unearthed, right, from our earth, from the different spaces and places. So I think it's really important to, to look at this and to think about it in the sense where when the Spanish came, you know, this immersion of Spanish uh, colonization, the ideologies clashed right there was a two different totally different ideologies um, they would have looked at this and of course they did look at this and think of it as demonizing so i'm happy that these oral traditions and, and that these relics have lived you know and they continue to be in different spaces where we can actually see them and see how people um, uh, use some of these things for uh, celebration of, of death right we also know this because According to Diego Duran in the 16th century, who was a priest, um, he witnessed the Aztec taking food and offering saltares of their dead. 
And so he recorded this. And there's a lot of various recordings uh, from the Spanish, right, that left behind, that came as colonizers and wrote in some of their journals in regards to how people were behaving, right, during that time and what they were doing. And I think one of these uh, was, of course, recorded, right? Um, Budan recorded that these people were taking food and were taking different relics to these different altares at that particular time. So we know that because it's recorded and because we have oral histories and oral traditions. And we have relics such as this, right, all over Mesoamerica. So as I was speaking, the Spanish and the, and the arrival, right, the immersion of these two cultures come together. Uh, the Spanish brought with them sort of the Roman Catholic holiday called All Saints. So some people think this is a religious holiday and it's not a religious holiday. It wasn't intended that way, right, um, originally from the indigenous point of view. It is, uh, it's not a holiday, but when the Spanish came in, uh, they created All, All Saints Day, which is November 2nd, right? And they also changed not just the day, they changed the whole way of, of doing this, right? We, we now only celebrate it, but one or two days out of the year, where in pre-Hispanic times, they celebrated it uh, for three months, at uh, the same time that you would plant corn and the corn was harvested, right? So that's really interesting. During this time, also a lot of Christians baptized um, a lot of the indigenous people, right? Uh, uh, not willingly, I'm sure it, it happened in, in ways where it wasn't um, voluntarily from indigenous people's perspective. So All Day Saints was born uh, when the Spanish came. So some people do celebrate that today. <clears throat> the Spanish colonization also, I, like I said, created this one day, the other was muertos versus, you know, the 30 days or 60 days or 90 days of the other was muertos. So we have the all day saint and we celebrate it on the first, right? I have celebrated it like an all night thing, kind of from the first, I've been in the ceremonies where you go and you danza or you do, or you go to different circles and you, 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 you know, put your altar up and put altar, various altares up, right? And there's no wrong way or right way of doing altares. And I think that Maria is going to be be talking about that pretty soon. Um, Maria Luisa will be touching base on that. It's really, really important to know that there's no one way of doing it. And there's no wrong way. So today we have various ways of to create all this, uh, some religiously, right? Some not, some uh, more with indigenous perspective, some more with the Spanish uh, uh, Christianized perspective, right? Um, there's no one way of doing this. Today, we bring, of course, like we create altares such as this, you'll see on the left-hand side and then on the right-hand side, we have corn. One of the things I tell my students all the time is like, you know, the immersion of sugar, you know, 500 years ago, we didn't have pan dulce, we didn't have the sugar skulls, right? We didn't have some of this sugar, this white substance that we use today on everyday foods, right? We didn't have uh, uh, flour tortillas even. <laughs> we had corn, everything was corn. Everything was, um, the offerings were corn, right? They gave us life and they still, they still give us life. Today, to this day, we still use corn as part, as part of our altares, right? I do, I know that for sure. Um, I also use bread because, hey, my grandparents, they love bread. They love pandus. <laughs> so I put that in there. Um, and, and, you know, it's up to you on what you really, uh, what is, what's personal to you, what was personal to the people that lived that you want to honor, right? On the other So that's the most important thing is to think about what they loved in life and for you to put that on the altar. Um, for Guatemala, I have a, a video for Guatemala, how they celebrate because my husband's from Guatemala and so it's very different. But Maria Luisa will be talking a little bit about how they put their altares up. Um, our talk, we're going to be doing another talk on Dia de los Muertos that I think will be a little bit longer. It'll be Dia de los Muertos Plata by the CCS, at CCS, uh, Chicano Chicano Studies, uh, and 1027 at 4.30 to 5.15. And I'll elaborate on the, on the Guatemala part a little bit more um, and how they celebrate today as well. One of the things that I do want to say is the significance of the Los Muertos, it does celebrate death, right? It's, it's about celebrating your loved ones and the people that have passed on. And every living human thing, every living thing, right, will die. Plants, our pets, us, every human, no matter how beautiful or how well-dressed or how much money you have or your title, whatever that may be, we're going to be exposed 
to nothing but a skeleton, right? A skull. So sometimes you'll see people um, painted, you'll see half of their face painted. A lot of, I get this question a lot. Why are half some people's painted in half? And I think it's because half decorated calacas and calaveras recognize that duality, right? Your your life and your and your and your this duality of life and death, right? Half and half. So some people paint their faces in half, and you'll see that, you know, in present day. And you know, we're in that moment. We're in that moment of 2020 where we are really living with that fear of possibly getting this um, this 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 pandemic, this COVID, this, and and we don't want that. And I'm not wishing that on anybody, but it could very well happen. And it's looking at all of us. It's every day. We're all being precautious. We're all taking you know, extra measures to be safe and to help our families be safe. And so, you know, we are celebrating the life and death of being alive, right? I'm celebrating that I'm alive. I'm celebrating that my family is, is, is good. Um, but we all have that, um, that duality, right? We have to think about at times. And right now it's, it, we're all thinking about it and it's, it's really hard. It's not easy. Um, so, yeah. And so here are more pictures about how people celebrate today. I mean, there's musica. People sometimes play music on their altares. Some people uh, bring mariachis. Right now, I don't think that's going to happen because of COVID again. There's some things that have changed, right? And how we do this. And that's why we're doing this, this virtual uh, altar this year. What's interesting is that I didn't plan this, but today is the seventh year anniversary of my grandma, who's on the left-hand side here. Uh, um, Refugia uh, Aguiniga, and then my, my uh, grandpa, uh, Reynaldo Aguiniga, she passed away seven years ago, today. And I didn't plan it like this. I just thought, oh, this was a good day and it was a good time. And so I'm honoring her and I'm thankful for all she's taught me. And I'm living her dream. Like she always wanted to be in college and she never got the chance because they were both, Bracero, they were both worked in the fields here in the Bay Area, when the Bay Area was full of fields. I mean, it was, it's changed so much now. Now it's Silicon Valley. Um, and then I also want to honor my cousin Chepo on the bottom here. Uh, he passed away a couple years ago. Um, and then my, also my grandma, my, my paternal grandma, Sara Escalante Cruz. Um, may they all rest in peace. And I'm just going to hand it over now to Maria Luisa so she could talk to you about honoring your loved ones, right? And and how do you do that? And thinking about the different ways of doing that. So I thank you all. Thank you so much, Maria. And thank you for the invitation to join you. I uh, wanna thank everyone that's here today. You know, uh, you touched on it and I think it's, it's just really important to remember that we need to celebrate this year uh, more, than, more than anything. We have, our muertitos are still coming uh, on time. You know, they're not gonna, miss anything because uh, there's a pandemic on and sure we have to take precautions we'll be online we'll, we'll still be celebrating and and th and that exactly is how we need to um, frame this because there is a lot of sadness there is a lot of um, of despair and as our ancestors will would say you know this is all part of the circle of life it's part of the cycle of life and um, how we react to these things is really what we're teaching to our children. And what better way to prepare them for, not just for death, not just for your own transition, but for any letdowns in the future. Uh, you know, you're, you're constantly having um, uh, challenges in life and how you react to them and how you overcome them is probably the best gift that you can give to your children. So that's why I think Dia de los Muertos is probably one of the most important lessons that you can share. And uh, for those of you that don't have kids yet, uh, just hang on because it's gonna be a wonderful ride once you do. So I'm gonna start sharing uh, just a short presentation that I did. I'm gonna be talking over some of these videos because um, of the time, <clears throat> but, uh, but do know that all of this is uh, available uh, for, for sharing at any future time, and I hope that we can get together again. So November 1st and 2nd are the days that we now celebrate Dia de los Muertos. As Maria said earlier, the original dates actually coincided with the harvest, uh, the harvest cycle, because it was the time when 
the spirits would be the messengers to Tlaloc and to the gods of sun and the rain to you know, make sure that there would be a good harvest. And so there were offerings made to the dead. Uh, today we celebrate these because uh, it was imposed on us uh, on the Christian calendar that these would be the days. And um, we have to make the most of it. <clears throat> on November 1st, the uh, souls of the children are are celebrated, and then on the second, it's all the adults. In the home, altars are set up, and this is an opportunity for families to uh, give an offering to help these souls to continue on their journey to Mictlan. The uh, home ofrenda has uh, so many details. I'm just going to be tapping on, on some of these, and you'll be seeing them in photographs. But in general, uh, there's a corner or a prominent wall in the home that is cleared out, and there are found out the foundation is set up for an ofrenda. And these ofrendas might include sempasuchi, which is a very important um, element. It's the flower of the dead. These marigolds have uh, medicinal powers, but they also have this unique pungent odor. The petals are also strewn about the front door, and they ha that helps to guide the spirit home. The, um, the other things that you would find on the, an ofrenda for certain would be candles, uh, copal, and pan de muerto. The candles would be all shapes and sizes, and it would include elaborate wax arrangements, uh, and these serve to light the way home for the departed souls. Copal incense is burned to cleanse the air, lift up the spirits, and it probably also serves to keep those little bichos off of the altar food and the sweets. You gotta, you gotta keep those bugs away. Uh, pan de muerto is, uh, is like a pan dulce, but it has anise, it's a special recipe, it has anise in it, and they're formed into the shape of small muertitos, or a skull with crossbones. And these are used to decorate uh, the altares, of course, by the end of of the days, they get a little bit hard, and you still share them with friends, and you just dunk them in your in your chocolate, and you know they get soft again. But the important thing is um, that this type of bread is only available during Days of the Dead. So if you haven't ordered yours yet, uh, get over to Pink Elephant or your favorite bakery, and uh, make sure that you have your pan de muerto for your altar. When um, when I was researching, uh, well. Let me, let me finish with the altares first. Uh, the other things that would be included on the altar would be the favorite foods of your deceased. It would also include a beverage and decorations like sugar skulls and papel picado, maybe uh, nuts, uh, fresh fruit, and things from the harvest would definitely be on the altar. Uh, this photo here is of chicken mole. That's very, very traditional in Oaxaca, where my family is from. Uh, the the serving in Oaxaca might be actually turkey, and the rice is white, um, the way at, at least my mama and my grandmother prepared it. <laughs> and the beans would be black beans, because uh, in southern Mexico, that's more, more prominent. The beverage should at least be a, a glass of water, but if you can flourish and buy some mezcal and sit, set up your, your altar with the mezcal, you're going to see that, of course, um, over the course of the days, the uh, beverage will evaporate because, you know, it does, but it could also be that the muertito was there and, and had some of it, so um, it's all good. There are also regional uh, hallmarks when you look at uh, altares from different communities. The one on the left is from the state of Oaxaca, from the town of Pochutla. Uh, and it has the traditional arco, which is uh, made of um, carrizo, the carrizo frame, and then it's just loaded with flowers and fruit. Also the, the, uh, the mat that's under the, the food that's laid out on the floor there, it's, um, it, it, it protects, you know, what you put on top of it. It's the uh, tapete, the woven mat. And um, on this altar, you can also see 
tamales and candy and la yudas, which are those huge tortillas that look like frisbees, giant frisbees. They're really stiff, but they, they keep forever and they're just delicious. On the right hand side is uh, an example of an altar from the state of Michoacan. And this one is from Hanizio. And um, Hanizio is the island in, in the lake where, uh, Lake Pascuaro, where now a gajillion tourists uh, overrun every year. <laughs> Photographers, you know, go to, to catch these opportunities, but um, it really has created uh, uh, some problems for the people that are trying to, to celebrate. And of course, it's still a tourist attraction. So, uh, you know, there's a give and take there. There's a positive and a negative there to, to how this is handled. Uh, so the last time we were in um, Michoacan this last November, we opted to go to Sinsunsan. Uh, we had been to Hanizio earlier in the week and we had seen the preparations there, but for the actual uh, Day of the Dead, we were in the graveyard in Hanizio. It had been raining. Uh, you can't see it. Uh, well, actually you can see the tarps above, which were just put up to try to control some of that water, but uh, there was, it was just a lot of mud everywhere. And of course you're in the dark, but you know what? It, it, it's such a beautiful experience. Live music, um, mariachi, banda, conjunto, you name it, uh, one would start and the other would end and um, each family would have arrived there earlier to clean the grave, to uh, give it, you know, touch up the letters if they needed touching up the paint, and also to uh, decorate it with Sempasuchil again and with um, candles and food. And of course they, um, We'll also take a meal to share there. And it, it's not uh, uncommon for them to, to share a, a hot drink if you're passing by and, and they wanna share with you. Um, it's the same with the homes during Days of the Dead. There's a lot of visiting happening. Uh, I had a chance to visit uh, in the town of Sachila in Oaxaca one Day of the Dead. I had the opportunity to make the rounds with a friend who was from there. And we took his offerings, we took gifts for their altars, we took candles, we took mezcal, and every home that we went to, we were fed and watered in every single home. So you, you, you can't say no, it's just not polite to say no. Um, another turkey mole, bring it on, you know, more mezcal, okay, here we go. Um, what was striking, what has been striking to me in my travels and, and my experience is that and no judgment here, okay, but the, I've noticed that the more humble the household, the larger the footprint of the ofrenda, and that's vice versa. <laughs> so, I don't know, um, maybe um, there's something there, but generally larger ofrendas are multi-leveled, and they go from the floor mat to mid and higher levels. Some will tell you that there's a significance in the number of levels, however, there's really no excuse not to put an ofrenda, even in its simplest form. An ofrenda would include a candle, something harvested like a flower or fruit, a drink, could be water or it could be spirits, and a personal item, could be a photograph or clothing or jewelry of the deceased. When we were in Pascuero, we also had the chance uh, to work with a group of middle schoolers at, a, at a, a middle school. They were setting up their school ofrenda, which you can see here. Uh, my husband and uh, my son, my husband's taking the photograph, but my son and I are there working with students to tie these flowers onto these massive frames, which are then conjoined and then they're erected and by some miracle they don't fall down. Um, really architectural feats going on there. And uh, in this particular classroom, the maestro had about 50 students. It was a huge hall. And there were maybe another 20 just outside the door begging to come in to because they wanted to help. Um, and he just couldn't take any more because he had a limit, you know, adult to student ratio. And uh, it, it was just beautiful to see how alive this tradition is in, in places like Michoacan and 
and in Oaxaca as well. In Oaxaca, the students will have um, competitions, altar competitions in the streets. And if you walk by, they will offer you a thimble of mezcal. But this is like a whole street lined with altares. And each altar that you visit, they offer you a thimble of mezcal. So by the time you turn around to come back on the other side, you're already kind of feeling it. Um, but the, the, uh, the beauty of it is that they're, they're also learning these traditions that are being passed down. And uh, they can share these with people like, like us that just go there to visit. Another uh, beautiful, I say, work of art uh, during this time are the alfombras. The alfombras are basically colored sawdust. Uh, sometimes they use uh, flowers or grain or things that were harvested to create these beautiful rugs. They call them uh, tapetes in the streets. The one on the left is from the state of Hidalgo. And right here, they are using a stencil uh, to get through this quickly, but also to mimic uh, the woven textiles from, from that state. The one on the right is from Guatemala. And Guatemala has an incredible uh, tradition of uh, creating alfombras around Semana Santa. When I was in uh, Antigua, Guatemala, I had a chance to work with artists on one of these all night, it was an all nighter. We pulled an all nighter. They, they saw me standing around and kind of, you know, looking like I really wanted to help. And they asked me if I wanted to help and, and they let me, then they allowed me to help, you know, they gave me a small section. And, and once they saw me finish that, they gave me more and we just pulled an all nighter. What was uh, interesting to me is that in the morning when the procession came through the street, uh, it's a procession where they carry these huge platforms with uh, effigies of the Virgen and the saints. Um, the artists that created this piece for the wealthy family that had hired them were maybe like halfway down the block and across the street watching the procession, whereas the family that had commissioned the piece were standing right in front of the of their their piece of the of the alfombra uh, to take the full credit for it, and and that's where the photographers were, you know, with this rich family, and and I saw the the artists, you know, like halfway down the street on the other side, and it made me so sad, you know, that they weren't getting uh, credit for their work. In fin, um, this alfombra on the left is from the state of Oaxaca. And this is the Virgen de la Soledad. She is the patron saint of Oaxaca. And the Catrina on the right, this is an installation that I made last year for the exhibit at the Martin Luther King Library. Now, you may wonder how, you know, how is this done? Uh, normally, these are done over a layer of dirt. And in the past, when we have done exhibits like this, we actually get a, a truck to bring in, haul in like half a ton of dirt. Uh, to do this. And, and there's a trick to this. And if you want to know the trick, then I will invite you to come and help me recreate this Katrina this year. Uh, I'll be working on it next Saturday. <laughs> Message me, chat me up, and you can come and, and see the secret uh, to creating this illusion, but uh, still staying, you know, in the, in the tradition of the alfombra. So this is um, now the product of all those years of traveling with my husband, all of the years that we have dedicated to folklorico primarily, uh, to learning about our traditions. We wanted to bring it home. And so this gentleman here that you see that it was dressed as a calavera, his name is Rick Mendoza. He used to live in San Jose, a wonderful artist. And he and I would every year create um, a celebration for artists that was writers, poets, musicians, dancers, uh, painters, you name it. Uh, we would have this house party at his house. He would set up the altars and I would cook the chicken mole and um, we outgrew his home and we were invited to the women's club in, uh, in San Jose near the university. We outgrew that in two years. Uh, we were invited to the Mexican Heritage Plaza and we were there for four years. And this last year, we were at the National Hispanic University grounds. And we hope that, you know, we'll find a home again when we're able to come together and meet. But the, um, the hallmark of this celebration is this dance called La Viejada. 
La Viajada is a masked tribute dance where the dancers are honoring a specific person. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about La Viajada in a second, but I wanted to, to share also the other elements of La Ultima Parada because we tried to recreate what we saw in Mexico where the graveyards, we had the Campo Santo, everything was solemn. But just outside, there's just a wild party raging uh, with kitty rides and antojitos and the Ferris wheel that you saw at the opening of my platica. Um, live music, of course, we were fortunate to have the opportunity to bring uh, local bands as well as bands from uh, other parts of, of the state and from Mexico to participate and just give our community on the east side uh, something really beautiful to celebrate. This particular year, it did rain on us. Uh, the opening blessing by uh, uh, Dona Leque was, was all we had time for, and then the rain came, and so we had to move everything indoors to the pavilion and the theater, and somehow everyone just went with it, and uh, it's just a beautiful celebration. We will be broadcasting all of the highlights from uh, the past Ultima Paradas on November the 1st. Uh, you can find more information on our website and I'll share that in a sec. But basically, uh, we will continue the celebration La Ultima Parada on November the 1st. That's a Sunday. And there's the website, laultimaparada.org. And you'll see more, uh, more detail once we, we have completed the program. I'm going to take a sip of water here and hydrate. So another highlight of the work that, that my husband and I have done because of our, our extensive work in Folklorico and with um, Day of the Dead, we were tapped in 2013 by the Pixar artists who were at that time creating a it was, still didn't have a name, the, the work that they were doing. It was all very top secret. We had to sign non-disclosures. And, you know, 2013 to when it was released, that was a long time. Uh, in between there, another production company rushed out um, Book of Life, I think it was called. It was, a, it was another Day of the Dead film. And, uh, but work continued on Coco because, you know, they weren't going to jump on it the next year because they weren't finished yet. Um, here you can see uh, at the top corner, we are giving the animators a dance lesson. Uh, we also took dancers to, uh, to be part of the, the example, you know, of how, how the skirts move and how the feet move. And uh, this is our daughter here in the yellow. And uh, she was one of the dancers. She's a lifelong ballerina. And she actually made it into the film. You can see... Um, when you see that pyramid of dancers, that's our daughter. So she's not a Disney princess. She's more like the Pixar uh, tune, I guess. <laughs> but um, we're happy with that. And then, of course, uh, we also managed to get into the credits. And, um, and we were invited to the premiere. What was really beautiful about the work that we did with Coco is how much respect uh, we were given by the animators, by the directors of the film. Their questions were right on. Their questions were exactly uh, what, why we knew that this was going to be a beautiful, a beautiful work of art. They had already been to Michoacan. They had already been to Oaxaca twice uh, before they even got to us. We were just kind of um, rubber stamping everything, every experience that they had already had. We were giving it the the, you know, that second seal of approval. And um, it was uh, a beautiful too in the detail when, when, you know, normally there's a red carpet for the premiere. They actually laid out an orange carpet and they just filled it with uh, Senpasuchi petals. And, you know, those little details, they, they stay with you. Um, also because my husband is a research scientist, we get to travel around the world. And these are just some of the posters that we have seen in our travels. Uh, the top left is in the Czech Republic and then in Japan. Um, and then finally in Mexico, when we were there uh, in Michoacan, 
uh, we were able to see the film again with a, a Mexican audience and it's the best. I wasn't watching the film at that point, I was watching the audience uh, because that's the most fulfilling for, for me as you know, someone that had worked with the, the makers of the film. What we also saw in Michoacan was how this has taken root. Uh, we saw children, uh, little boys and girls, dressed as Miguel, running all up and down the streets, asking for their Halloween. Uh, calaveriando is the term. In the past, calaveriando was to collect money for the community altar at the church. And the men would dance, you know, and they'd go around with a handkerchief. And this is specifically in San Luis Potosí, a mass dance called Juan Negros. And they um, ask for money, and then that money goes to build a community altar. But uh, now it's like a distorted uh, Halloween where the children are uh, creating these beautiful, uh, they don't go around with a paper bag or a plastic bag. They go around with a beautiful carved uh, watermelon or some kind of uh, melon that they've carved into a calavera, and that's where you put the money. So I uh, want to talk a little more about La Viejada. This is a, a dance that now we have adopted in San Jose. La Viejada de San Jose is, uh, is the continuation of what was created in the, La Región Huasteca, but now we have made it our own. In the past years, we've had over 200 masked dancers. Generally, uh, the majority are coming from the folklorico companies in and around San Jose, but they also include the parents of the dancers, the grandparents of the dancers, uh, anyone that can walk can learn the dance. It's a line dance, it's repetitive. Um, the sones are lively and they're a lot of fun to dance to. For La Viejada de San Jose, new songs were created for this piece by the violinist that you see there with the orange jacket, that's our son. He is a composer and a musician, and he was raised in this tradition of uh, La Viejada. La Viejada also participates in the celebration, the citywide celebration, which is sponsored by SJ Mag, the Multicultural Artists Guild. It is our great honor every year to participate in this community parade and to perform with students from San Jose State, as well as students from uh, all of the folklorical companies that, that come to us. It's also our response to um, the unhealthy things that are attacking our community, like diabetes, hypertension, uh, because this is a, a great workout. So if you're feeling COVID, uh, COVID heavy, <laughs> maybe you want to uh, join us in some of our online dance classes and, uh, and get your viajada on. And actually, I have to say, disclaimer, when we made this film, we didn't know that you needed a permit to film uh, in front of City Hall, but in fin. Es mejor pedir perdón que permiso. Thank you so much for your kind attention. So I think we're going to take some questions now, right, Maria? Yes, thank you. That was beautiful. I, can I saw it already, but that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, we're back. We're back. And we can take questions from anybody. Like if you, you know, want to make an altar and you're not sure, or this comment. is a good time to ask, you know. There's so many things you could put on there. It's not, there's no wrong way of doing it. That's another thing I wanted to point out. There's no wrong way of doing, making your own altar, right? Your own offerings. Yes, we were thorough, Maria. Huh? <laughs> I guess we were thorough. I guess. I hope so. <laughs> I don't see anything in the chat. I'm looking at the chat. I'm like, I'm trying to do two things at one time here. But <laughs> yeah, the computer is acting crazy. Let's see your <laughs> I know. I love seeing students. Come on. Can, don't be shy. See you and, um, I and, see some uh, of my students here. <laughs> unmute yourself is, is the new catchphrase, right? Yes. You hear that every day, huh? Hi, Dr. Cruz and Maria Lisa. Hi, Maria Lisa. How are you? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, hi, Daisy. it's Daisy. 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 It's Daisy, yes. <laughs> hi, maestras, how are y'all? Thank you for the beautiful presentation. Oh, thank you, Daisy. You're going to see it again in class. <laughs> Yay. You're welcome. <laughs> um, the one question that I had was, I've heard a lot of different, like, time limits for the time that you're allowed to, like, leave food on the altar. 
Um, so I just wanted to know, like, is it three days? Is it, could it be all of October? Well, as Dr. Cruz said earlier, uh, Daisy, this celebration used to go over three months. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, I left my altar up longer than the two days simply because it's so beautiful and yeah, I just felt like it. Um, but the food does go bad after a while, so you need yeah. to recycle it or or share it or or do something with it. You know, keep we we just keep replenishing um, the supply until you know it's Christmas and like okay, you know, got to take it down now. <laughs> Yeah, it's really up to you, like how long you want to, and yeah, if there's ants, like I get ant problems, so I have to figure it out, you know, when to take it off, but it's really up to you when you want to take it out, what you want to take out. Thank you both for this presentation. It's so, it's just wonderful. I love, I love to see um, and learn about these things. I'm wondering, you, uh, Maria, you mentioned that um, the three months that this was, do you know of any communities, do either of you know any communities that are doing it? longer than the two days or i know we are at sjsu <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're doing it for a month at least so i was like wow we're we're getting in the spirit here because we're doing a whole series for a whole month so that's a start um yeah. but i don't know like my 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 husband's family in guatemala they live in like a you know in the sierra like in the mountain area and they do celebrate it and they celebrate it for a couple of weeks at least but you know, it, it is go. It goes with the cosecha, right? Of the of the corn. So it's not. I think it's it's interesting because they they'll put up their altar for the for the time, but they they celebrate uh, their people all year round. So they have altares all over the like different altares in, in the house. Like I do too, right? I have altares not just for Day of the Dead, but I have altar my altar that I have all year round that I just you know put sacred objects there, or people's pictures, and I keep all year round, and not necessarily with the candle, but there may be candles there. So it's interesting that my, my husband's family does that. They do various altares and they have some up right here and there. And then they have the one for the Los Muertos. And so it could, yeah, there's some people that do do that, right? Not necessarily the Day of the Dead, but all year round. And certainly the preparations too, because oh, the yeah. you, you know, that takes, I, I've grown my own, but at, by the time, you know, you can't time it. You have to you have to order your simpasuchi so, so you know for sure you're going to have some. But uh, Maria Vargas Murillo, you're asking about uh, food culture. And yes, there are many lessons that you can share with your class. There are many recipes online right now for pan de muerto. Um, and it's a lot of fun to do with your, with your students, with your kids. Uh, sugar skulls are another fun project. Uh, although those are more hands-on with the teacher, which I know during right now during the pandemic, maybe we can't can't do those. Uh, chicken mole was um, actually uh, a course that I had offered here for the university. <laughs> and I, I didn't have, uh, let's see, I had Daisy and, and one other uh, student, uh, a Korean student that wanted to learn how to do it, but it wasn't enough students to, to make the class fly. But uh, I'll offer it again. Uh, chicken mole is is delicious. Turkey mole is delicious. And uh, yeah, if you are interested in, in tasting some of my mole, um, when I set up the, uh, the Calavera Catrina again um, next Saturday, I'll, be, I'll have some of that mole on hand. So if you want to come and help me, I'll feed you. Hi. Hi, um, Anthony. Question. Um, Dr. Cruz, I know that you mentioned in the beginning that like this is a tradition that has been going on for like 3,000 years. And more. Yeah. Um, like I know like when we think in terms of like religion and um, like the afterlife, like people go to heaven. Uh, what was it like in these indigenous communities? Did they also believe that they like went to a heaven or where did the dead go? Because you also mentioned that how they had to come back, like find their way home. <laughs> I, that's a good question, and it depends on the region, right? Every region had a different way of thinking of life and death, right? The afterworld, like the Maya, the afterworld, the underworld, the, the different levels of worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Seven different levels, seven different le Well, in Wiradica culture, in my ancestry, they, they have uh, five different worlds, right? The four directions and then the middle. 
in, in my uh, in my husband's family, it's seven direct seven levels, right? And then the afterworld, and the afterworld is, you know, down in the bottom. And so some a lot of indigenous well not all but some most of the indigenous cultures did believe in like this circle of rebirth and death, right? Rebirth and death. Not necess- some maybe reincarnation, but others more like the spirit, your spirit of rebirth and death. Right. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't necessarily like a heaven. There was, you know, because the, the, there's no word in even in the in Wiradika culture, there's no word for heaven and there's no word for God, which is what I've been finding. In like a colonization thing, like I feel like that, that ideal. Yeah, it's it's, it's interesting because there, if there's no word for God or there's no word for heaven in trans, translating that, then, you know, there was all these. Um, I guess beliefs, right? That uh, uh, our spirits are our spirits, and then they go on to different worlds. So that's, and that depends on the on the different uh, native spaces and places, right? Because it's just, I always try to use this analogy of food. It's just like food. Uh, I can make enchiladas one way, and I could be I could be Luisa's neighbor, and we can come from the same region, but we may we could come from this kind of similar regions or really close, but we do things very differently, right? So I think about it in that way, because that's the only way I can think about it is through food. We all, we can come from Jalisco, all of us can come from Jalisco, but we can, and we can even come from the same town and sell and and make these, these plates very differently. Right. So Mm -hmm. um, I think about that in like indigenous cultures, there are various places and spaces that celebrated different things, but certainly life and death was one of them uh, across all Mesoamerica, because there's been so many uh, findings and, writings about sort of the this fascination with life and death right and that, and i don't even know if it's fascination it's just part of life mm-hmm. right and accept and, and then accepting that and i think when in western culture it's very like when the western ideology in spanish came it was a very different uh take on death right it's yeah. a very different ideology a, a way a di- way different way of thinking of even death right sometimes people don't want to talk about it it's too heavy it's too much uh, don't want to even acknowledge, you know, sometimes the people that are passed on and so forth. So two different ideologies just, you know, coming into, into um, not even an understanding sometimes, right? So mm-hmm. it, it's, okay. it's a good question. Thank you. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I would say you did. Like, the, it's just different, like, for different cultures and different beliefs. Like Yes, I mean, even to this day, that. right? We all don't celebrate mm-hmm. the Los Muertos the same. It's very different for all of us depending where you come from depending how your family does it it's just yeah it's definitely yeah thank you so much you're welcome i have a comment and a question first of all i'd like to thank both of you so much for this wonderful hour uh so educational so informative and so enjoyable i mean the images were just beautiful um i have a question regarding the ultima parada uh, Maria Luisa, you know, I, as you know, I participated in La Ultima Parada for a couple of years, and it was a wonderful, very spiritual experience. And I'm wondering, is it going to be performed again um, this year? And if so, if the lessons are all online, or if somebody wants to participate again, what what would be the first steps? I would have to get you the link of where you can find the tutorials for the class. It will all be online, sadly. Uh, we will have pods of, um, of dancers uh, around San Jose. Uh, primarily, you know, they're, they're going to set up in their neighborhoods and we'll, we'll bring it all together. But you know, Zoom is very difficult to, to um, uh, put that music and, and, and every, all that dance together without some editing. So yes, there will be dancing. Yes, there will be masks. Um, and we will, um, we will continue with this, with this tradition. And uh, now that I know you're interested, I'll, I'll certainly share more information with you. And of course, info, I should put here um, the email address for La Ultima. It's info at la ultima parada dot org. 
Thank you so much, Maria Luisa. And uh, to all of, the, all of you who are listening, I want to greatly encourage you to participate in La Ultima Parada. It's a wonderful experience. And you can honor someone. When I danced the first time, I honored my mother and I wore her hat and her pearls. And it was an uh, unforgettable experience. So I want to encourage um, all of you to, to participate. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very, very much. This was a beautiful experience and I hope you attend the rest of our platicas. Uh, the last platica, of course, will be virtual. Um, it's a virtual altar at the SJSU King Library by Miguel Aguilar, so that's gonna be amazing. And, and the rest of the um, events will be uh, TBA, so we'll be sending out uh, um, flyers on those dates. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you. you. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.